Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Metabolism-Based Therapies in Epilepsy workshop. My name is Adam Hartman, and I'm one of the program directors in the Division of Clinical Research at NINDS. We're really thrilled that you're joining us this morning for this workshop. I first wanted to start by um, thanking our organizing committee, particularly our chairs, co-chairs, Drs. Mackenzie Cervenka and Juan Pasqual. They put a lot of work into this, and I think and I hope that you'll see that today. From NINDS, I also wanted to thank the other members of the organizing committee, particularly Vicki Whittemore, who's really helped us behind the scenes get this organized. Um, and uh, formerly of NINDS, Andrew Breeden, Christina Sagerlanches, and Nick Wims. Um, and currently at NINDS, Carlos Ferraco, who's uh, really helped us a lot, and Tim Leiden, who's been doing an amazing amount of work behind the scenes. We also wanted to thank uh, the people at NINDS who help us organize these conferences, including Toya Rogers and Nadrian Tiklar. From NIDDK, who's also co-sponsoring this event, we wanted to thank Dr. Christopher Lynch. We also were joined on the organizing committee by Dr. Yi Song Wang, who's from NCCIH. The goals or deliverables from this conference, including hopefully linking preclinical and clinical work more directly with specific attention to rigor and reproducibility. We hope to gain a greater understanding of how to approach studying mechanisms by which dietary treatments of the epilepsies impact the brain, excitability, and seizures. We also hope to improve preclinical and clinical studies in the field, both in terms of experimental design and the use of biomarkers. As you know, there were some pre-workshop videos available for your review, and we assume that you've seen those videos today. As I've joked before, I'm a father, and so I know that not everybody does what we ask them to do, but Hopefully you had the opportunity to do that. There were talks in there including foundations, including rigor, preclinical research videos, including dietary components, translational research, and clinical research. The discussion today by our panelists will be using those talks as a launching point for moving forward into a real workshop discussion. We're going to start with opening comments from me and we'll move on in just a minute. We also are going to have panels, three of them, on preclinical research, translational research and clinical research, followed by another panel really tying thing together, things together, and then some closing comments um, as well. We ask that you please submit your questions to um, the Q&A panel um, that's available in the chat. So with that, I am going to um, stop sharing. And it is a real pleasure for me to um, introduce our Institute Director, Dr. Walter Korschetz, who was selected as the Director of NINDS on June 11, 2015. Dr. Korschetz joined NINDS in 2007 as the Deputy Director, and he served as the Acting Director from October of 2014 through June of 2015. Previously, he served as the Deputy Director of NINDS under Dr. Story Landis, and together they directed program planning and oversaw scientific and administrative functions of the Institute. He has held leadership roles in a number of NIH and NINDS programs, including the NIH's Brain Initiative, the Traumatic Brain Injury Center, collaborative effort between NIH Intramural Program and the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences, and the multi-year work to develop and establish the NIH Office of Emergency Care Research to coordinate NIH emergency care research and research training. Dr. Korschetz. Thank you very much, Adam. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, super. Well, as Adam said, here at NINDS, we're really excited uh, to work with the folks uh, on this workshop, and particularly to our colleagues at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disorders, otherwise known as NIDDK. And you'll hear many reasons why this is a really important collaboration as we go through the day today. Um, so this is called Metabolism-Based Therapies for Epilepsy Workshop. And um, so there have been some you know, really new findings in epilepsy. This is not one of them. This dates back to Hippocrates, as far as I can tell, where fasting was actually first proposed as a treatment for epilepsy in fifth century BC. But we really haven't really learned how it works um, or how best to institute it. Um, it kind of lay dormant uh, for until um, about early 1900s when a couple of docs also started to use uh, uh, fasting for epilepsy patients, reporting 
uh, interesting, good findings. And Stanley Cobb, Mass General, who was actually uh, in those days, neurologist, psychiatrist were really in, in, in indistinguishable. He was actually the chair of psychiatry at, uh, at Mass General. But anyway, he started working in animals and treating um, children um, with Lennox, um, a famous epileptologist, uh, with uh, um, fasting, identified acidosis as a potential uh, mediator, increase, along with increased uric acid of, of the decrease in seizures that occurred. And, um, and then uh, people at Mayo, uh, Wilder found that maybe ketones were really the key factor in the fast. And in 1971, Dr. Huttenlocker, who was uh, a mentor of mine in medical school, introduced medium chain triglyceride diet uh, to form a ketogenic diet. So you'll hear more about the history, but the point is that this is a longstanding natural experiment uh, with clear effects on epilepsy. And, and now we have new tools to try and understand how it might work and new knowledge and where to look. I'd offer people the fact that the, in the Brain Initiative, there are now tools where we can um, look at the activity of millions of neurons in the cortex um, simultaneously um, using optical signals, um, uh, something that wasn't possible just five years ago or so. And of course, epilepsy is your classic circuit disorder. It's a disorder in which large areas of brain, large numbers of neurons start to spontaneously fire and into very unusual uh, ways with the uh, paroxysmal depolarizing shifts. So there's a real circuit signature to epilepsy. And we now have tools to look at how it starts, how it stops. And I guess one of the messages uh, that's gonna come out loud and clear in this workshop is the fact that the brain is not operating uh, on its own. It is uh, situated in the body. And I think we've all been uh, on the neurology side, all been kind of uh, uh, guilty of not really paying as much attention as we should to this. And, and the fact that you know in, in, in Hippocrates time, the fasting and epilepsy was thought that epilepsy was coming out of the intestines. Um, uh, seemingly um, humorous in, in when I was training, but now with um, new knowledge about the link between the, particularly the gut immune system in the brain and, and, and uh, the, metap the microbiome, uh, these things really uh, may actually prove to be true. Um, so I think that uh, the workshop although an old problem is really has some really fresh ways of approaching it. And clearly the, the goal at the end is to try to take this natural experiment and try and refine it so that it can be, have greater impact uh, for the children and, and even adults who uh, suffer with uh, extremely difficult to control or uncontrollable epilepsy. So I'm looking forward to the workshop myself and I wanna thank Adam Hartman and Vicki Whittemore and their team have been driving this effort at NINDS, the organizing committee, our NIDDK colleagues, and all the attendees for their attention and, and hard thinking throughout the rest of the day. So thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much, Walter. We appreciate that. And we um, now it gives me a real pleasure to introduce our conference co-chairs, Drs. Mackenzie Cervenka and Juan Pasquale. Dr. Cervenka is an Associate Professor of Neurology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She's the Medical Director of the Johns Hopkins Adult Epilepsy Diet Center and the Adult Epilepsy Monitoring Unit. Dr. Cervenka designs and conducts clinical trials examining the feasibility, tolerability, safety, and efficacy of ketogenic diet therapies in the management of adults with drug-resistant epilepsy and refractory status epilepticus. Dr. Juan Pasquale is the inaugural holder of the Once Upon a Time Foundation Professorship in Pediatric Neurologic Diseases and also holds the Ed and Sue Rose Distinguished Professorship in Neurology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. His laboratory and research interests range from the bedside to the bench. He has special clinical research expertise in undiagnosed and rare diseases, glucose metabolism, mitochondrial, degenerative, and multi-organ disorders. Drs. Pasquale and Cervenka. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Adam Hartman and Vicki Whittemore for this opportunity as well and also my co-chair Juan Pasquale.
here are our disclosures. And I think that Dr. Corsets just gave a beautiful uh, overview of the history of metabolism-based therapies for epilepsy. And I just want to add to that by highlighting a few important points. When we think about the history of metabolism-based therapies for epilepsy, you heard just now about Hippocrates and body purification, as well as fasting for the management of seizure disorders. As these therapies have evolved over time, a recurrent theme has been, as we've heard, ketosis. Ketosis is the process whereby the body will metabolize fat into ketone bodies, acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. Now, as this evolved, we also began to discover that changes in glucose metabolism also affected seizures, and that perhaps this idea of using what we would call a ketogenic diet, as we heard back as early as 1921 or 100 years ago, may have to do not just with the production of ketone bodies, but also with glucose metabolism as well. And fast forwarding to more recent years, there have been a variety of metabolism-based therapies, particularly diet therapies that have been proposed over time, including, as you just heard, medium chain triglyceride oil diets and a reemergence of the classic ketogenic diet, which was in part due to involvement of family organizations that really propelled the diet in the early 1990s and, and, so, and so forth. And then more recently, there have been modified diets that have been proposed, including the modified Atkins diet, the low glycemic index treatment, and then more recently as well, the modified ketogenic diet, which is used primarily in the United Kingdom and in Europe. And so now you can see that there are at least five metabolism-based diet therapies that have been proposed and that are being used in the management clinically of epilepsy and also in status epilepticus. And what the main theme of these different therapies are is one, either and or producing ketosis and or managing glucose modulation. And as you can see, there are several questions that still remain with regards to these diets because we know that these diets have to do with proportions of fat carbohydrate and protein as macronutrients, but we don't know what the exact composition of these diets should be. And this is part of what ongoing research needs to be. Now with regards to these metabolism-based therapy indications for epilepsy, you can see in 2018, a consortium of pediatric neurologists put together lists of individual epilepsy syndromes uh, in which the diet is particularly effective or these ketogenic diet therapies are particularly effective. And the question is, why are they effective And in, in these particular instances? And if they are not in certain individuals, why is that? So you'll hear later a panel that is going to be discussing clinical research using metabolism-based therapies. And there are several very important questions, including what questions remain unanswered in the field of metabolism-based clinical trials? What strategies can we use to design rigorous, unbiased clinical trials? What tools are available, and particularly through NIH, with regards to designing these trials? And what clinical trial designs can be used that also inform mechanistic discovery? And so I'd like to now turn it over to my co-chair, Dr. Juan Pascual, to talk more about this mechanistic discovery. Thank you. As you will hear throughout the day, uh, we are going to be discussing novelty, but we're also going to be focusing on mechanisms. The uh, standards are quite high for the uh, uh, debate, as you will see in a moment. And um, if you um, want to uh, follow me for a moment and um, um, share the, these very high standards, I'd like to review what exactly um, it's a mechanism. Something that happens when something else is also taking place at the same time. Something that happens nearby, something else, proximally related in space, or something that's conceptually prior to, or causally uh, prior to a phenomenon. Um, all of these things are uh, problematic in a sense when we're dealing with metabolism and epilepsy. If you look at temporal associations, they're not that strong. Here is the uh, prevalence of autism and the uh, organic food sales in the US. Obviously, they're very well correlated. One is not the cause of the other. Um, another example, something that happens within the brain 
um, um, nearby the phenomenon of interest doesn't really need to be related uh, in terms of mechanistic um, um, conceptual value. For example, the theory of monomine low levels in depression. People who have depression have low levels of monomines in the brain, in some parts of the brain, and the assumption is that that has to do with uh, synaptic events, and therefore, uh, if those are rectified, you should be able to um, um, get people out of depression. The only problem is that that doesn't quite happen in the time frame that it should be happening. This takes quite a bit of time, yet um, um, the contents of these things in the brain can be rectified very quickly. So something is not quite exactly in agreement with that conception. And finally, uh, it's a mechanism, something that will be causally um, related uh, in, 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 our, in our conceptual framework. Not always, think about the sodium channel controlling excitation. In many cells, that's exactly the case. You need to have uh, voltage gated sodium channel activity to have the cell made excitable. For example, here is a heart action potential where a great deal of sodium current, it's really uh, uh, very important to have that component of the action potential. But if you eliminate that component, what happens? Will excitation uh, be gone? It really isn't. At the bottom, in light blue, here is a progressive reduction in um, that amount of sodium current. This is a, a computational model by 20%, 40%, all the way to 100%. Minimal impact on the cardiac uh, frequency. So yes, these are conceptually important molecules, important phenomena, but given the rest of the mechanism, not in isolation, not just in the causal scheme, you need to comprehend the rest of the system. And so all of that, as you will hear in a moment, it's um, uh, probably relevant in terms of mechanistic uh, science, mechani mechanistic uh, views, but provided um, you can modulate them and have an anticipated result, and also that things fit within the conceptual framework. There has to be a context for everything we do and say, and that's how science can move forward. So thank you very much to everyone. Thanks especially to um, Adam and Vicky, they put in a tremendous amount of work and we look forward to the workshop. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful uh, setup and a wonderful framing for, um, for the rest of the discussion. So uh, next, we're um, pleased to welcome Drs. Devin Crawford and Shai Silberberg. Dr. Crawford is a scientific program manager in the Office of Research Quality at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke where her primary focus is on improving experimental rigor and transparency in the broader biomedical research community. Dr. Silberberg is the director of the Office of Research Quality at NINDS, leading the Institute's efforts to increase the excellence of science and the completeness of research reporting. Dr. Crawford and Dr. Silberberg. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, and also the other organizers for having us. Uh, we're very happy to be here today, and hopefully everybody watched the pre-meeting recordings, but uh, for this small session, we are just going to reinforce the importance of rigor and transparency in research. But first, I wanted to introduce our office, the um, NINDS Office of Research Quality where we work to improve uh, rigor and transparency in biomedical research. In addition to myself, we have John Rohde, a AAAS fellow who recently joined the office, as well as the director, Shai Silberberg, who is here today both in this session and will be a part of some of the panels later today. And with that, I want to hand it over to Shai for a few words. Oh, thank you, Devin, and thank you, Adam and Vicky, for organizing this and for uh, inviting us to be, be part of this uh, very important meeting. Uh, I really am going to say just really a few words and uh, to highlight what I think is the take home message. So and Antonio Damasio, the chair in your science at uh, South uh, University of South Carolina, California, uh, while talking about this machine that we call the brain said, why do we have brains in the first place? Not to write books, articles or plays, not to do science or play music. Brains develop because they are an expedient way of managing life in a body. In other words, what he's saying is that this machine is not a perfect machine for doing science and other things that we think we are you know, uh, um, doing very well. So if I could have the next slide, please. And I think this is, was best said by Emo Phillips, 
who said, I used to think that the brain was the, one, the most wonderful organ in my body. Then I realized who was telling me this. So what they are saying really is that we have deficiencies in, in how our brain works. And one of the primary deficiencies is that we are prone to unconscious biases. We think we are in control. We think we understand everything that we're doing. We think that what we're doing is without error, but in actual fact, there could be serious unconscious biases and that we have to do the best we can to minimize these unconscious biases. And I just ask you to keep this in mind when you listen to uh, Devin's uh, next slides and also during the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. So as you may recall from the recorded session, we discussed a lot about how these unconscious biases can affect our experimental results. For example, through inflating effect sizes or increasing the likelihood of seeing apparent differences between groups. And we also discussed some of the ways to uh, reduce the risk of these biases. For example, by making sure that we have a sufficient sample size, by randomizing um, uh, subjects or animals to the treatment groups by blinding the investigators during the experiment as well as during the analysis, as well as making sure there's good quality control and good inclusion exclusion criteria. But um, low quality can actually come in at multiple points in the experimental life cycle. So at, from the very beginning, if you're generating your hypothesis based on biased uh, past data, then the design of the study, this is where statistical power blinding randomization will come in to help reduce the chance of bias. When you're conducting the study, making sure there's good quality control, good validated um, measures, as well as good inclusion exclusion criteria. But then afterwards, when you're analyzing and interpreting the results, there may be some analytical flexibility that allows you to pick and choose which um, analyses to report because they show you more interesting results. And then ultimately deciding whether or not to publish the data based on whether or not you can create an interesting story to sell. And then that leads to there being biased data in the literature for generating the next hypothesis. So you can see how this cycle can go round and round, uh, weakening the strength of scientific evidence in the literature. And ultimately, these things can come together to undermine our ability to translate from basic research to human treatments. And here I'm just showing an example from uh, ALS drugs. And so all of these drugs here failed in human clinical trials, except for the first one that's FDA approved. And these clinical trials had been based off of preclinical um, animal model studies that showed survival benefits with each of these drugs, which you can see by the blue bars that extend out to the right. But these early studies, some of them had low sample size, or it wasn't clear if they blinded or randomized, or if they had good inclusion exclusion criteria. And so the ALS Therapy Development Institute came along and redesigned these studies and tested all of these drugs over again except with at least 25 mice per group, the ALS mouse model using the same model. Um, they included blinding and randomization and had clear inclusion exclusion criteria. And what they ultimately found was negligible effects of these drugs on survival in the mouse model, which matches what we saw in the clinical trials. Now imagine how much time, money, and patient risk could have been avoided had the original animal studies just been performed more rigorously. And so um, fixing rigor in early studies may not be a panacea for fixing translation from animal models to humans, because there are a lot of other issues as well, but it is a necessary first step to have rigorous preclinical studies if we don't want to be led astray during translation. And I'm not saying that all researchers need to be, you know, perfect, um, and we may be starting from different levels of research quality based on the type of experiments we're doing, if we're doing discovery research or we're doing clinical trials, we may be at different points um, in the design of the study. I'm just saying that as researchers, we should be always trying to improve. And so if everybody just decides to do one change in their experiment, then the next study that they do to make it a little bit more rigorous, then over time, 
everyone um, will be doing more rigorous research and it will shift research quality to the right to more rigorous overall research. Um, and so uh, we can all be working towards improving rigor and quality of our research and translation. And with that, I just wanted to leave everybody with some resources. Don't worry if you don't have time to write these down because this session is being recorded, you can go back and look. But NIH has multiple resources on rigor and transparency, as well as information on rigor items that should be in every single NIH grant application. This includes the rigor of the prior research that you're using as your key support for the application, the rigor of your proposed research in that application, including consideration of biological variables like age, sex, and weight, and how that might be affecting your data, as well as in a separate section, authentication of your materials, making sure things like your cell lines and your reagents are what you think they are. And NINDS also has some resources. Um, the link here is to our Office of Research Quality if you wanted to learn more about us. But we also have a Rigor Champions Initiative. So if anybody's interested in discussing these issues, looking for solutions, please feel free to join our Slack workspace and email us at rigorchampions at nih.gov if you would like to do that. Also, please check out our um, rigor resources table. We have over 100 rigor resources that have been crowdsourced from the community that you may find helpful. So please take a look at those and let us know if there are any more that you know about that aren't already on our list because we would love to add them. Um, so hopefully these resources are useful to people in the community. And with that, I'll see if there's time for questions. Thanks, Devin. Um, we um, don't have any questions um, showing up in the chat. Wait, we just have one show up in the chat. Um, so here's a question for you. Um, should research applications also address nutrition as a biological variable and ubiquitous environmental exposure? If you believe that the biological variable can have an effect on the research, then yes, absolutely, it should be addressed. I would add to that that one should, you know, that's something that needs to be tested. Um, mm -hmm. There are interesting studies, you know, one of which just came out um, that that showed how uh, the environment the animals are kept in actually had minimal impact on on the outcome of the study. Uh, so I think all these things have to, you know, be tested before one decides this is very important. So that's you know not important, and of course that would change under different circumstances. And I would always err on the side of being transparent about what those conditions are, especially when you're porting out in your papers, because it may or may not have an effect on the research. But we want to be able to go back and test those things in the future if it becomes an issue. Wonderful. Thank you both very much, and thanks to. Um, conference chairs and to Dr. Korshitz uh, for all of your comments. We really appreciate it. We've built in a few breaks um, into the uh, uh, webinar, into the workshop. We know that it's, um, these are trying times. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, reconvene again with our preclinical panel at 1140. So in about 10 minutes, um, go ahead, stretch your legs, um, take, to, take the dog out really quickly if you want to. And uh, we'll see you back at 1140. Thank you.